I'm Joyce Russell. I'm the Senior Associate Dean of the Robert H. Smith School of Business. Hi, I'm Lisa Anders. I'm Vice President at McKissick & McKissick. Hi, I'm Lisa Johnson, Director of Human Resources with Textron Systems. Hi, I'm Ashlyn Broder, and I'm a Public Relations Specialist at Textron Systems. Hi, I'm Maria Resigno. I'm an attorney with Textron Systems. Hi, I'm Caroline McCarthy. I'm the University Relations Manager for Textron Systems. Hi, I'm Kristen Welch. I'm Senior Vice President of Global Content Operations for Discovery Communications. Hi, I'm Sharon Strange-Lewis, Senior Director of Women and Diversity Programs at the Robert H. Smith School of Business. Hello, Women's Business Report. We are Women Leading Women. is it about mentorship and then this whole notion of sponsorship and how important is that and really getting an advocate for yourself so thoughts well for me I I didn't have I had personal mentors sort of people who like my mom and others that I surrounded myself with that sort of was kind of the rah-rah you can do it mentor but being in engineering and in construction, um, they had assigned mentors, but that didn't quite work for me or them. So I mean, and we're talking, <laughs> we're talking uh, 25 years ago or so when I got started. Um, I think the companies uh, now have come a long way with that, and I think mentorship is is very important in helping to advance your career. Um, and more importantly, though, that sponsorship piece that you were talking about is important, but you have to make sure you attach yourself with the right sponsor, mm -hmm. that they are the upwardly mobile person in the company that is favored, so to speak, because it's not just the person you get along with or the person that can, um, you know, they might guide you, but they might not be the one in favor, and so you want to attach yourself to uh, some of the right people. So it's a, it's a little like um, solving a puzzle and finding those mentors that you connect with and that will advance you and advise you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think for mentors, you should have plenty. You know, everybody you can find, and it could be up and down the spectrum. I mean, I think I got so much out of my early career just being with my peers across the company and you know we would go to lunch every day and just share stories and um, you know they were you know I was in I guess at that time I was in programming but you know my friends are in scheduling and content and production and um, marketing and PR and just hearing what was going on in the other parts of the company really just helped us make connections and learn about the business in ways that we wouldn't have had we not had that relationship. So I think my colleagues were as much mentors to me at that time in my early stage of my career. Um, and then I think it's just you find the people you connect with in the company. And um, it could be one, two levels up. There's obviously the formal mentorship programs, which I think are as important too. But, you know, I mean, just reach, I think that just reaching out to people, having the personal relationships, getting together in professional groups um, after work. Anything you can do. I mean, I really just like the term networking because it seems so mm -hmm. forced and fake. But um, if you can go to the events just to meet people and hang out, I mean, that just always helps with confidence. It helps with relationships. Um, I think sponsors are a little trickier. You know, those are the people that are really going to be your advocates in the organization. And I think that has to be a very specific almost a natural connection you have with somebody and almost the sponsor picks you in a way mm -hmm. then you pick the sponsor because it for the person really to be your advocate and push you along um, you know again it you have to, it, it yeah, is such a, a specific and um, personal 
relationship that's going on. Yeah, it's almost like um, a gift that you didn't ask for. Right. You're all of a sudden you're like, well, why are they doing that for me? Mm -hmm. And but you have to kind of hold on to it and realize that's what's happening. But we've talked about that, so we we want everybody here to be really aware of the importance. I think they've highlighted, and I know our other speakers have too, that you do need to have mentors, and you do need to be thinking about sponsors, people that um, they seem like mentors, but they are your advocates. They are people who will who will recommend you for those higher level positions. Your mentors might be your role models and people who listen to you when you want to chat about things, but sponsors are the ones who push for you and say, wait a minute, we have an opening for something, let's think about this person. And so you really have to be aggressive and make sure that you have, or you're forming these relationships. So you brought up networking, and we all know that networking is important, and of course you're all here, and we're going to be networking, and so <laughs> give you all a lot of credit right away for just being here, but what, is, what are the things that you all recommend um, as it relates to networking? And I should point out, we do have courses in networking, Dr. Bartol's taught one of them. Um, and so that's a good idea to learn more about it. But I mean, what specifically should people do to, to really be effective at networking? Because we talked a little bit earlier about this. All right. You Thank you. Go? Well, I, I, I don't think I'm particularly good at it because um, <laughs> I don't do the formal, you know, researching and reaching out to people. Mine is just much more organic where, you know, if events interest me, I'll go, I'll meet people try to connect with them. I'm not diligent about you know trying to research who I want to meet and going out and meeting them. So I know people do that and there's nothing wrong with it. That's just not my style. But for me, it, it's making connections with people, having a place to go. You know, I, I think I told the story last time I was here. I just always, wherever I went, um, outside of work at least, fe felt like a fish out of water, whether it was you know going to my church because I was the working mom, you know, and or you know just different places I just always felt like I was the, the different person and um, I remember my, my first time I'm, I'm um, with an organization called Alliance for Women in Media and the first time I went to a board meeting there I was like I'm with my people like these are my people like I've been <laughs> here and it was just such a a great feeling just to go okay wow okay I can finally relax and let my breath out and just be me because I belong here you know and they get me and yeah. so for me, that was, just, you know, I, I have plenty of those relationships at the office, but this was a place that I could go outside of the office and actually feel like I was understood. So that's what it means to me. So for me, networking, um, you know, I'm an engineer, I'm kind of analytical, but I do have the other somewhat gift for gab, but hadn't really exercised it except in trying to build buildings. And then about five years ago, um, but some of this confidence I have to give uh, uh, some credit to the Smith School for, because I did go out and get an MBA, but um, really hadn't utilized it in my career until maybe more, more like five years ago. And so my job is about networking as a um, head of business development for the company, trying to bring in new work. And I sort of went about it a um, in a way where my job's to get new work, so I want to meet with you, you have work, I, and that's all I thought about talking about. So over the past couple of years, um, I've more evolved to uh, sort of taking a posture of relaxing and really building a relationship and connecting. But the difference, um, and probably not even only just because I'm in the construction and design and engineering business uh, probably happens in all industries. Most of all of us are going to face where the, a lot of the people in the room, except like tonight, uh, are going to be mostly men that we're networking with. So how do you build that connection, that relationship? You have to find some common ground beyond the work that you're trying to get. So um, the advice is, you know, try to develop interests or other things that you can talk about just to build a relationship. So it doesn't feel like every time you're trying to network that that's really what you're doing, but you're more building a relationship with that individual. So we were talking earlier about um, really having things to talk about, mm -hmm. like sports, right? right? And you know, sometimes people are like, oh, I don't know anything about sports. Um, or 
I, you know, I think it's interesting because it's the same kind of thing as um, when you're, you know, a lot of us do executive education work, right? So when you go into an audience, you have to have something to connect with. I know for me, if I go to a new city and I'm doing some work, I always talk to the cab drivers and see what's happening in the city. And I try to read, scan the paper, the local paper, just to see what's going on. So you can immediately mm -hmm. make connections with people. Oh, I see you guys are sponsoring, you know, this big event or you have the sporting event going on or whatever. Because usually people will talk about it without offending them, right? Um, so, you know, sports are really important. Real estate's really important. I mean, there's, there's certain topics that most people, especially men, um, gravitate towards that makes it a little bit easier and I think that's what you're saying figure yeah. out what those are so you have a personal connection so one thing I've done to that point um, when I know specifically I'm going to an event and certain people are there that I want to meet I will do look up their bio and try to find some sort of connection even if it's just something like they ski whatever it is something that I can start a conversation mm -hmm. on yeah, that's great advice, and there's no reason not to do that now with right. being able to find pretty much everybody, you know, either on LinkedIn or, mm -hmm. you know, so. Um, so one of the things that, and I think our student presidents talked about, um, and officers about a lot of different eventing that they have done, and our MBAs talked about their Get Confident series mm -hmm. that Tiffany mentioned. I know Allison was heavily involved in as well. So they developed a series of, you know, things that women generally don't have a lot of practice in, like golf. Or um, you guys talked about uh, learning how to play poker, understanding spirits, um, not those heavenly kind, but the other kind of spirits. And so, or maybe that's what you're talking about. I don't know. Um, so, are there other areas, or what do y'all think about um, certain other kinds of skills that would be really beneficial for people, in addition to the coursework that they're doing, to get gain additional confidence in? Well, I know when I was here, we took that etiquette class and you know, how to go out to dinner and the plates, and I thought, you know, and, you know, how to talk at a, um, at a cocktail party, how to hold your glass and your plate, like, that to me actually has, I think about that all the time whenever I go to a cocktail party. <laughs> I'm like, here's how I hold my cup, do I have my name tag in the right place? So, to me, that was really valuable. I, I mean, I think confidence is a hard thing. Um, you know, I know you're asking more about skills, but I think confidence is something that, for me at least, has kind of, you know, I've had my ups and downs where some years I'll feel really empowered and confident and, you know, two months later I just, you know, I sink again and you have to kind of pull out your, your old um, tricks to kind of build it back. But I think you just, you know, throughout your career you're going to have your dips and, and just, you know, having that self um, reflection to figure out that, okay, this is, just a time in my life and I have to sit back and, and try to figure out what are the things that I can do to get that confidence back. And, um, you know, so that's been a learning experience for me over the years. And, you know, I've had years where I've been just kind of down on myself and just, you know, I, I kind of go into hibernation a little bit and, you know, like, don't pay attention to me. Let me just do my work and I'll get out of here. And um, then I'll kind of emerge from it and be like, okay, I'm ready to go. What's my next project? And, you know, so I think the important thing is just not to beat yourself up about that and just know you're, you know, there, you're going to have a long career and there's going to be plenty of time to make your moves and other times to kind of retreat a little bit and, and kind of build yourself back up. Well, you talked about self-reflection there, mm -hmm. and that's really important for people to periodically take stock. Right. Um, and just the recognition that, you know, there's going to be ups and downs and that's normal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Well, for me, on um, you know, I am a tomboy, so I connect a lot of times with things and conversation that guys like to talk about. But I practice a lot on people that it doesn't matter. So I'm going to the grocery <laughs> store. <laughs> you know, I'm at the grocery store. I'm checking into a hotel, whatever. I'll just say, "Hi, how are you?" And I just try to connect and practice and. I mean, I don't do it as much anymore, but when, you know, a couple years ago when I was really trying to build up that confidence, um, it, it helped to do it where there was no risk. You know, it didn't really matter if the, if the guy at the hotel didn't speak to me or not. Most likely they did, but I would just randomly, even on, I mean, how many people get on an elevator and people say nothing? Yeah. Nothing. 
So I would do it then. I would just say hi, you know, and start talking and then realize, hey, they're not going to do anything bad to me. And it gave me the confidence <laughs> to be able to go out and be in an event where it does matter and just go up and introduce myself and start speaking to people. Great tip. So now in the elevators, all of you should be talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> At least there. We'll be making a lot of hotel clerks a lot happier now. <laughs> um, so if we, you know, it talked earlier about enticing women to go into business, and I know you've dealt with a lot of um, all-male environments. So what thoughts would you all have about how we get more women in business um, to really, you know, first off, get interested in it or, you know, to then be able to have an impact in business? What do you think? Um, I was thinking about that when we were talking yeah. earlier, and I'm just thinking back to my childhood and then I actually have both of my daughters here in the audience and we talk about business a lot but when when I was younger I mean I think there needs to be some discussion specifically about it because business really just seemed like well it's going to happen I mean it's bit I mean it's business it didn't feel like if you're a doctor you're an engineer right. you're a lawyer it didn't have its distinct differentiation because everything that we do is business, oh, right. whether it's the trash collection company or the utility company or the engineering firm or whatever, it's all business. So it just felt like, you know, somebody runs that. But I think um, reaching to the younger folks and having them understand the specific differentiation between, um, you know, everything is business surrounded by it, but helping them understand how you can develop from that, the actual skills to run that business, even if there's a, a trade involved in that business. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I was thinking that when we talked about it earlier, like what does that even mean going into business? Like how would you even explain it to, you know, a young child? I um, I was going to say unfortunately, but I love them. I have sons, so, um, which I love my sons. I was going to say unfortunately, I don't <laughs> I have sons, but um, no. Okay. So, I <laughs> so I was trying to think. I can't even think about what I'd say to my daughters because I don't have them. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, I think a lot of times when you talk about business, everybody thinks sales. And I think yeah. for, for some people, they gravitate towards that and I think that's an easy sell, um, no pun intended. But I think for the other people who just aren't really interested in the sales side, I think that's the harder conversation. Like, how do you convince them that it's not all sales or other mm -hmm. aspects? I try to say it, you know, like for me, I'm somebody who I love TV. I love that I work in TV because I have an excuse to read people and all the tabloids because it's part of my job. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and so I, the one thing I've been saying to my sons, and I think you can, um, you know, switch it is, you know, they're both very into music and sports, and they're probably not going to be professional athletes, and they're probably not going to be professional musicians, but that doesn't mean they can't go into those fields and work in the sports arena or in um, the music arena, whether it's in marketing or in sales or in finance or any of the other support areas um, that you need running those businesses. So. I think that might be another way to kind of, you know, figure out what that particular girl is interested in, and then say, okay, well, here's how you can. Here's another way that you can work in that field, other than, you know, being the designer or the, um, you know, whatever she might be interested in. Right, because even if you're interested in art, right, there's that's a business, right? Right. So yeah. right. there's that aspect of that. Right. You can so run you're a gallery connecting the dots should. on that. Yeah. Right. So now I know you both were in fields that you know, heavily dominated by men, and people always want to know, so challenges associated with that. One of the ones that you had mentioned to me before is getting feedback. <clears throat> and so maybe you could talk a little bit about that, about the difficulties getting feedback from men. Yeah, I was just saying, um, for probably the past 10, 15 years, I've worked for a man. He's been my direct supervisor, and 
every single review and every single time I've gone to talk to him, how am I doing? Can you give me some advice on this? I'll even say, hey, look, I know I'm not good at this particular thing. What can I do? Oh, you're great. You're great. Don't even think about it. You're doing a wonderful job. I mean, and I was saying, you know, this is really, I feel like it's been a disservice to me. I don't know whether they're, it's been two different men, but, you know, I don't know whether they're afraid to hurt my feelings or they're afraid I can't take it or, but I, I just feel like it's, you know, like I'm seeing things that I should be developing, but I'm not getting the right feedback from them about um, what I can be working on. And so some other things will get reassigned to somebody and they'll give me a different project. But I've seen it a couple times in my career where I've lost projects because they've given it to a man who's, I admit, is better at it than me. But had I been given the chance or told what the expectations were, I might have done a better job at it. Um, so I just, you know, I, I haven't been able to figure out how to, I have a meeting scheduled in a couple weeks to go to lunch. <laughs> and, um, I'm going to say, look, I'm going to have that honest conversation and say, like, I've tried to talk to you about this and you've blown me off, so I really need you to sit here and tell me what you think. And I, I promise I won't cry. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned funny. your fear of, like, um, don't say anything, Shawnee. <laughs> You mentioned your fear about them sometimes overprotecting you, and there's actually research on that, that right. a lot of times that um, men will overprotect women or persons of color because they will, they know they'll stand out, and if they don't do something right, then that's a worry to them. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think you're saying it's really important to get that feedback right. and not be overprotected because you can be held back by being overprotected. So Lisa, your thoughts? I've been fortunate to not really have that problem <laughs> <laughs> with feedback because um, early in my career I worked for uh, Clark Construction and Turner Construction and they have a very robust review program and um, um, a lot of um, mentoring and uh, classes that you can take and so on but they have I don't know it's like a 10 page review and you get very direct feedback, not only from the higher ups, but also from your direct um, person that you're working with. And because that industry is so driven on immediate performance, like if you didn't pour concrete that day, we have a really big problem. That feedback was instantaneous. So that's how you know the last or the first say maybe 15 20 years of my career but now i work for a woman she owns a company and i certainly get direct feedback from her so i've been pretty fortunate as, as it relates to feedback so but i think just be aware of that because if you're not getting the feedback that you need once again that's the benefit of mentors and sponsors yep. where people can other people could tell you as Brenda said, give you the real poop, right? <laughs> but I will, let me just add this. So um, in my current um, company, we, I'm one of eight leaders. We're all in the same level. And we all report to the president of the company, president and owner of the company. And there are some women and some men that are my colleagues. And instead of coming, the men coming directly to me, with whatever issue they have with my team, they'll, they'll go to the president. So there is some issues with that, and I've addressed them front on with that, saying, hey, if there, I can't solve your problem, but here you're going to go above, give me a chance. So I would say when you're uh, facing things like that, that you just, I mean, they don't expect you to do that also. <laughs> so if you just confront them head on in, you know, obviously a professional manner, it helps you gain the respect and redirect the problem and, you know, sort of work collaboratively to solve those. So that's where getting those practice skills and having difficult conversations mm -hmm. uh, would be really beneficial. So I want to open it up to questions. Is there, before we do that, other some other burning piece of advice you want to make sure they get um, before we ask for other questions? Um, Puts the pressure no. on you. <laughs> <laughs> or a tip or something that you want to make sure that everybody in here does? Hmm. Um, well, I'll just pull something from my, when I spoke 
five years ago. Um, whoever, who, if anyone was here, they probably remember this. But um, you know, I would just say, just make sure that to what um, Brenda was saying, follow your passions and really advocate for yourself. Don't just wait for that promotion to come to you or someone to pick you out or, I mean, I know sponsors are sometimes odd. They might have to connect or pick you out, but really advocate for yourself onto where you wanna go in your direction. Don't just wait for, for that uh, next step to happen. I have two Great actually. advice. Sure. <laughs> Thinking back to my last talk, one is um, don't be afraid to make a decision. You know, I can't tell you how many times early in my career where, and even today, where we'll sit in a conference room and everybody's looking around the room, like the answer is obvious, but no one wants to kind of say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And um, you know, I think a way that you kind of get your authority, and I don't want to say, well, I'll say power is by making a decision and um, you know it might be the wrong decision I you know I'm leading this project now that is pretty big and it um, it affects the whole global comp company and a lot of you know it's IT and HR and finance and you know people are afraid because we haven't worked everything out and I said that's my job to worry about I will take the fall if this doesn't work Thank you for pointing it out. That's your job to make sure I understand all of all of the different, you know, risks and things that aren't perfect yet. But we'll we'll solve them as we go. And I just need you to keep moving. And I'll tell you when you can stop moving. But if if we hit a roadblock, that's mine to solve. Like that's my problem, not yours. And you know, I think it, it's sort of given people the freedom to keep moving. Otherwise, you're not going to get all these groups to agree on the direction. But I had to take that and say, we're going this way. I need you to come with me. And we'll make some pivots as we go. And I think, you know, just I might get in trouble. I might make the wrong step. But I'll be honest about it. And I'll go to management and tell them what happened. And, you know, and then we'll figure it out together. And I think people are just always afraid to make that first move. Uh, my second one is to, you know, when you're working with your mentors or your bosses or the people in your organization and they say, hey, have you thought about this job? Or, you know, you should think about applying for um, this position over here. Follow up on it. Like, do it. There, because a lot of times you, you know, individuals will kind of pigeonhole themselves into a certain track or to a certain field and a lot of times people who work with you see things in you and your skills that you don't necessarily acknowledge yourself or haven't recognized and so you know I can't I ended up in finance and doing the job I am because somebody did that for me I would have never thought to do finance um, but you know I still don't consider myself a true finance person I'm an operations person who understands finance but I'm working in a finance role because somebody saw something in me that I would have never picked out for myself. So pay attention to what other people are encouraging you to do and follow up on it. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think there's plenty of research that says that women want to be 100% sure that they have all those skills, right? We've all heard that. <laughs> um, and yet, you know, I hear you saying first in your first piece of advice, just, you know, you can make the decisions. And then the second thing is, other people do see other talents that you have that you may not see, mm -hmm. and so pursue those. Okay, so let's open it up to some questions. Um, and how do you want to do this? Yes, Adriana, start here. I think the mic's coming. Coming behind you. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Adriana. I'm a second year MBA student. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's always nice to see alumni and have this kind of congregation in the Smith community. My question is around um, the balance of uh, kind of soft power and, and kind of a firmer kind of power. I find myself struggling with that and I've been told a lot that I'm too direct and, and, and come, up, come across as too aggressive. So I've, I've always struggled with how to be firm and yet not aggressive, but also not to uh, you know, uh, under under sell myself, like saying a lot of maybe or would you, and you know. So I've mm -hmm. kind of heard both sides. Like, don't don't um, 
sell myself short or don't or don't seem unconf uh, uh, not confident, but then also not too aggressive. You know, so how do you <clears throat> balance that? Great question. <laughs> I think um, part of it is. I think part of. I don't. I think you should be direct. I think if you have something to say, you should say it, and you shouldn't have to temper yourself. Um, maybe what they're talking about is recognizing that there might be another opinion or that somebody else might have a different viewpoint. And I mean, I, I don't know you, so I, um, <laughs> I'm not saying anything personal, but you know, maybe it could be that it's, you know, wait, take a minute before you say something to listen to what other people have to say and then tailor your remarks to, um, to that and recognize that there's different opinions. Uh, that, that to me is where the kind of softer skills come in, where you are, you are a listener first, you're, you know, and it, it's part of negotiation, but it's also part of leading, like understanding that there's different perspectives and viewpoints that, you know, you need to take into account and then tailoring your marks to make sure that you're hitting each one of those people, that, they're, that each one of them are getting something out of what you're saying. Right, I mean, people are different receivers of information, so the listening part and the observation of the personalities of the people in the room and directing your response. I do think you should remain being direct, but it's just how you communicate that to the people um, may need to change. You have to, you know, sometimes you might be talking to somebody that you, I think you just have to know personalities the same answer might have to be delivered differently to different people. Okay, other questions? Yeah, Allison. Hi, I'm Allison Davern. I'm a second year MBA. Um, my question is regarding a story that was in the national media like this week, so maybe you guys have seen it. But it said that um, some study that managers are actually penalized in the workplace, either through lack of pay or not getting promotions, if they advocate for diversity, inclusion, and equality issues. So wow. my question to you all is, have you seen that in any of your experience in the workplace? And um, if so or if not, what strategies do you use to ensure that you are advocating for what's right for your people or for the culture while not taking a personal hit to your career for doing so? I have not seen that article, um, but at least in the industry and the space that I'm working in, there's actually a major movement to having more diversity and inclusion um, because folks think that, and I believe that, it makes for a richer um, delivery of services and strategic partnerships and so on. But personally, um, and, and what I do at my company and what our company does is, uh, Part of our mission, actually, is enhancing people's lives through the built environment. And that also means in our community. So what are we doing to uh, have diversity and inclusion? So it, we just adopt it as a part of our culture. So I personally don't face um, that in my, um, it's not a hindrance to my career development and growth. Yeah, I would agree. I don't think it's necessarily a Penalization. I think, though, I mean, I have, I have seen or observed situations where you can see how um, how companies would become very male oriented because you tend to hire people you know. Like you mm -hmm. start hiring in your community, and if your community is all white males, then that's who you're hiring just because that's the pool you're drawing from. So I think companies have been much more intentional about going out and finding the different pools. But even, you know, I, I can just see a, even in certain departments where, you know, within a company where you're kind of going to the same pool of people to, and it, it's just because it, it, it's not intentional, it's not even conscious, it's just the group that you know and the people that you're comfortable with and um, that's who you end up hiring. So I, I think you have to be I think companies have learned that, and they're being much more specific about making sure that they're reaching out and getting the widest pool of applicants. And I think they're realizing the benefit, too, of having that diversity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially for the global companies, you need to have 
um, know the different cultures and the different situations. Um, and most, you know, most of the mo most of the companies today are dealing in the global marketplace. So, well, and I think that study too. Um, I think it sort of highlights that. Sad to say, but we often need our male colleagues to help us to have, for an issue to have credibility. Mm -hmm. um, and so for the issue of diversity and inclusion to have credibility, sometimes we need to embrace um, male colleagues. And I think that that's one of the things that, you know, um, we even did, you know, the group tried to do this year, right, of trying to get men in the conversation. I think even on campus, that's what we're trying to do, get um, other people in on the conversation so that everybody's speaking the same language, right? Um, and I think the more we can do that, I think that will help address that. I think we have some questions back here too, right? Yes, right here. Oops. Oh, well, that's okay. Go ahead. You have the mic, so. Yeah. And then Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriella, American University undergrad alum and a future, hopefully, mba -er somewhere. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I guess I have a two-part question, and we've kind of been touching upon certain things, um, but I'm, I'm curious. How have the both of you been able to stay true to yourself without necessarily being pigeonholed into the role of the woman in the organization or in the team or the Latina or the African American? Um, so how have you both dealt with that? Um, and then we also kind of touched upon men, but uh, how have you avoided or how have the both of you necessarily um, dealt with uh, sometimes working with our men counterparts um, and getting them to respect us without necessarily being seen as pushy or aggressive um, because you know by the time we actually get our seat at the table and get our respect um, they might have a certain view of us and then it makes it that much more difficult to work together um, so those were just my my two questions good questions for y'all mm. <laughs> they are good questions. you've had a lot of practice with yeah. both those questions so. <laughs> Well, I was fortunate early on in my career, Discovery actually was a very um, diverse, we actually was 60% women. Our um, president and CEO was a, CEO was a woman. Um, and so I actually didn't face it early in my career. I, you know, it was great. Um, and then as we started getting bigger and going public and bringing all the Wall Street people in, um, it sort of changed a little bit. And that was actually, quite hard for me because I did um, have a situation where we had a new CFO come in and um, my first meeting I apparently with him insulted him because he said something and I told him he was wrong. And so for the next four years that he was at the company, um, I pretty much had to go underground a little bit. I voided the floor, you know, I, he did not like me, it was very obvious. and. Um, you know, I just had to wait it out, and it it was pretty uncomfortable, and I didn't enjoy it. But you know, I I uh, he left eventually, and so I outlasted him. Um, <laughs> she outlasted him. But yeah, I mean, it is it is tough. I think sometimes you have to you you just you have to be. That's I think where you know the confidence starts waning, and you just have to kind of be true to yourself and know that you know what you're talking about and again find the people who believe in you to to keep pumping you up and you know just be confident that you're doing a good job um, it it's not easy it's there's not like a magic solution to solve it but you know if you just you know i think people will respect you the, your colleagues will respect you if you kind of don't cave and you just keep plugging along and doing what you need to do and speaking up and um, you know, if he had stayed, I probably would have eventually had to leave, but um, <laughs> fortunately for me, that didn't happen. But it, it, you know, I mean, I think in different stages of your career and in different stages of a company, you're going to run into different situations and, you know, you just, you just have to take a deep breath and <laughs> kind of know that, that you're good enough to be there, you know, and, and believe in yourself. Um, for me, it's the true to yourself. Um, ooh, this is a good one. So, in in the industry where I started my career, um, it was mostly men, and you know, and I even tell my kids this now. You know, you should dress and sort of look a little bit conformish, but 
still with your own style because, and, and it does sound kind of like you're not being true to yourself, but if you do it within some sort of boundaries of what is still you, but I just don't believe in making yourself an outlier just because, because I want you to hear what I'm saying and not be distracted by however I may be dressed different because I'm different than somebody else. And of course, I'm already showing up different because I'm a woman and the rest of you are men. Or I'm African American and the rest of you are white men. So I already have that. So I, I always um, would be true to myself in, in within some standard deviation, right? <laughs> and, um, and, and so that was more early in my career, and, and, and I still sort of do that. I feel like there's that, that sort of work person, and you still find that person within the, the person I am at home, but it's like a subset. So that's what I mean by that standard deviation. But I think in the core, I'm the same person walking around. I'm not going to waver. I still keep the same grace about me. I still have the same integrity. And I'm not going to, um, you know, I, I still stay honest and things like that. Like I'm not going to deviate from my morals, so to speak. But it's more of a visual thing that I may change. And then related to, um, what was the other half of your question was about dealing with men. Um, you know, I, I, early on in my career, I don't really do this now, but early on for me, it, it was, you know, something I would call like Jedi mind trick. So I might have the answer. I would almost always have the answer. Um, and especially if I'm dealing with someone uh, above me, I would sort of rephrase it and saying, well, do you think this would work? And then they look at it, and then you know, they, you know, the answer was yes, it would work. Or you know, sometimes it makes it, it, they can more accept it if it seems like they bought in or that it was partially their idea. But <laughs> over time, and you're working with that same person, they realize that you have the knowledge and then you're going to be the one that would shine through. And there will be maybe that person who's sponsoring you in, you know, in the future. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it sounds like a very woman thing to say. But I, I've always tried to make my bosses look good. You know, so I kind of do some things behind the scenes to make them look good. And then they become loyal to you because they know you, you're helping them out. Right. Um, so I think that helps. But I'm always, it, it's always so funny when you were talking about being true to yourself because there's two or three men in particular I can think of that their work personalities are the biggest jerks. Like they're just jerks at work. Like people don't like working for them. They manage up all the time. They don't manage down well. They're just very demanding. But you see them outside of work with their families, and they're like these big softies who, like, mm -hmm. you know, their kids and their wife run them around. And it's just so funny because I don't think a woman could do that. Like, I just don't think you could be one personality at work and one personality at home. It's like kind of you are who you are. But I just, I always laugh when I, like, I just think it's so funny. But <laughs> it's great when you see them outside of work, because then you know they're, see, you know they're, you know that's probably who they really are, and then they're just kind of playing and the role they think they need to play at work, so then you can kind of work them a little bit that way, so. But that's actually, that goes back to when you discover those kinds of personal things, mm -hmm. that actually helps you in working with them. That's what I mean. Right, like, I right. Kind of, I use that to my advantage now. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, absolutely. Well, I just figure they don't get to run anything at home, so that's why they act that way. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> okay, so let's take one last question, and you are ready to, yes. And they'll be around for a little bit so we can ask the other questions. Yes. So, hello, everyone. My name is... Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Chisha Susan Chen. I am a second year Master of Finance candidate and will graduate in this May. So I am going to be a kind of an entry-level analysis or training in finance industry, like really in the coming future. So I have a very um, a 
really controversial questions like I I may face in the future working um, field. It's like um, I think sometimes it's really hard for like uh, women entry level person to seek for mentors um, for their senior level uh, managers. Actually, most of them are men. So, do you have any tips or suggestions for like entry level women how to seek for um, mentors? from their senior managers, um, most of them are men. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think a man can be a mentor for you. I've had plenty. Yeah. So I think you know you just need to find somebody who, and look at for somebody who you respect and you like their style. And you know, most people, male or female, if you ask for help and if you ask for advice, people want to give advice. I mean, you're flattering them. And you know, you, if you go to them and say, hey, I, I've, I've been watching you, I think, you know, I like the way you do X, <laughs> Y, and Z. Can you help me out? Um, so, Excuse. yeah, I mean, I think if you can't find a woman, I think finding a male with the personality and the traits that you like will do just fine. But sometimes, like, um, if you go to that cinema manager, maybe a little bit more often than others, so sometimes, like, your colleagues, they may have some little bit gossip about you. Whether you are, you are seeking for that, Male senior manager for other things as well, like maybe you should seek what, uh, maybe extra benefits from him. So that's why I kind of like raise up these questions. Like I pretty, because I kind of not me. It's like maybe some other my my previous colleagues in my internship. They she kind of faced the kind of similar situation. Yeah. So that that brings up a good point, and one of the things that I talk a lot to um, women at my company is. Remember that everybody is really focused on up, but your colleagues are the ones that are going to make or break you. Because mm -hmm. if you're looking for a promotion, if your colleagues don't like you, you're not going to get it. Because they're going to be asked just as much as the senior people working with you, whether you're liked or not. And so in that situation, I would make sure your colleagues knew what you were doing. Like, hey, I'm going to go talk to this guy. and. You know, I'm going to ask him to be my mentor, and they would know. There wouldn't be any gossip because they should know exactly what your, you know, goal is and your strategy in that situation. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you have those relationships and that, you know, you're not competing with your colleagues, but you guys are helping each other out because the more you help each other out, and the more people see you helping somebody else, the more likely they are to help you. And um, you know, I had somebody early in my career that she, we were kind of peers, and she just, she would kept always, she would get frustrated because she would say, oh, well, Kristen's the favorite, so I'll never get the promotion because she's the favorite. And I was like, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> like, I'm not going out. And like, she always felt like I was undercutting her, and I wasn't. But, um, you know, I, I think you're going to find those situations too, but you just, you just have to be, you know, be honest with yourself and with the people around you and just be authentic. And you know, yeah. don't play those games. Just be yeah. honest and open about what you're trying to do. And if people want to say things, they'll say things and you just can't get caught up in that. Yeah, and you, you bring up a good point. As the performance reviews, a lot of them are these 360 reviews where they're trying to get feedback from your peers and your bosses and direct reports. You want to make sure that you have good relationships with people at all different levels.